Okay, I'm back. Uh, sorry about that. I was having a few uh, difficulties on my side and not being able to see anything. Still not being able to see anything, but I'm assured that I am actually online. So uh, hopefully you're getting this. If you are not, I apologize and we'll try to fix it a little bit later. As I was saying, uh, we are so glad to be able to of Facebook Live when we can't meet in person. I uh, hope that everybody is warm. I hope everybody has uh, taken care in this time, uh, you know, of, of inclement weather. I don't know about you guys, but it was beautiful at my house uh, when I got up yesterday morning and saw the beautiful uh, snow. Uh, it was quiet. It was still. Really enjoyed seeing God's beauty uh, in his creation. Uh, so I, I think I am working now. I'm starting to see some folks uh, joining me. Uh, if you would please begin to put in the comments that you're here uh, let me know and uh, hopefully we can uh, have some interaction here as we spend some time in God's Word as I was saying make sure you grab a cup of coffee We've got mine right here your Bible uh, turn to Acts chapter 10 and we're going to be spending some time in God's Word this morning uh, to encourage one another as we walk in Christ. Uh, you know, as you're doing that, I was uh, looking this this morning on my Facebook feed, and I saw a, a great friend of mine uh, posted a great meme about uh, how sometimes we feel inadequate as we read the Word of God, because a lot of times as we're reading it, uh, we struggle with reading it, number one, because, uh, you know, it's just, it, 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 it's so sometimes difficult for us to understand and so therefore when we don't understand something a lot of times it's easy for us to just you know to move on to something that's a little bit more comfortable for us and I really appreciated my friend's honesty about her struggle there and others were, were coming online uh, posting on that that feed as well it said hey you're not the only one and I just want to encourage all of us uh, reading God's Word it, it can be difficult and and it is a discipline you know uh, when I use that word discipline discipline. Uh, you know, probably the most ready uh, example of discipline that we would have in our daily lives would be, you know, going to the gym. I mean, how many of you said that starting January the 1, first, I'm going to get in better shape, and therefore I'm going to join the gym, and I'm going to go exercise every day? Well, uh, if you're like most people in America, that lasted for just a little while, and you've already noticed that you're starting to slack off, because let's, quite, let's be honest with you, most people, now there are lots of people that love to go to the gym. My, my daughter and my son-in-law, Hannah, and Jake, they love going to the gym. Uh, but most people, a lot of people that I know, the majority of people I know, don't like really going to the gym. Now, I've got friends that go to the gym, even though they don't like going to the gym because they know it's good for them. And so they've created this discipline in their life where uh, even though they don't exactly like it all the time, they understand the benefit that it is bringing to their lives. You know, reading the Word daily can be exactly like that. Uh, you know, you get into the Word, and, and the, the, see, the Scripture tells us that it is making a difference in our lives. It is doing something in us. We might not be able to recognize it in the moment, but later on, as we begin to look back, we will see how the Word of God has grown in our lives and began to change us from the inside out. Now, to all to those of us who, who admit that to struggle with consistency in the Word and uh, who admit that they don't often understand, or a lot of times they have a, they struggle understanding what they're reading. I just want to encourage you. You know, don't stop. Keep reading. You know, last week uh, when we were online, we talked about Philip and the eunuch. And remember, that Ethiopian eunuch, he was reading scripture. He was reading from the scroll of Isaiah, and he didn't understand what he was reading. And, and God brought Philip right to him at the exact moment that he needed so that Philip could explain to him what he was reading. You know, God will do the same for all of us. If we'll make a habit of getting into God's Word, God will put people in our path who will help us understand the Word of God. You know, that's why being in community with other believers is so important. That's why being a part of a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church is so important. We come together around the fellowship of the Word, and we begin to grow as we spur one another along. Community groups are a great way of doing that. When we gather in homes and small groups, groups and we we open God's word we can ask questions we're among people that hey if we can we say hey I, look I don't really understand that we're not going to be belittled or nobody's going to laugh at us or look at us like we've you know sprouted another head uh, that we're going to encourage one another so make that effort to get in the word daily build that discipline into your life and you will be surprised at how much more of the word you begin
begin to understand. Uh, most importantly, though, as that meme was so, you know, so great to point out, you know, as we get in the word, we fall deeper in love with the author of the word. And see, that's the important thing. That's the most important thing. The word of God, it, it opens us up to relationship with God. And as we connect more deeply with God, as we fall more deeply in love with God, we will be absolutely surprised at how much we grow in our understanding of God's word. So that is the pre-sermon. Now, uh, I do want to make a quick announcement. Today is uh, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. It's a Sunday uh, in each January where we say, set aside to remind ourselves of the importance of the church standing on the Word of God as it relates to abortion and uh, the, the things that are going on in our culture. Uh, the church is pro-life. That means that we believe that every life is important to God. We believe that there's no such thing as an illegitimate child. There are a lot of illegitimate parents, but there is no such thing as an illegitimate child. There is no uh, such thing as a child that was a mistake or a child that was, uh, you know, was not anticipated. We might not have anticipated the child, but God created every life with purpose. You know, we, we find in Jeremiah, where God says to the prophet, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. And that is a powerful reminder to us that God is the author of life, and he is the one who gives life. So every child is important, and every child is, is specifically created by God. Therefore, as the people of God, we must compassionately uh, and, and forcefully say to our culture that God, God does not like abortion and, and God does not in any way shape or form endorse abortion and this this uh this activity that's happened in our country for so many years now has literally uh, killed a generation of Americans. And uh, we need to work uh, and, and do the hard work of prayer and also do the work of, of getting on our, our knees before God so that we can see this this uh, this terrible blight leave our country. But now, saying that, you know, we're not just pro-life when it comes to babies or, 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 feed it or, or babies in the womb. We should be pro-life as, it, uh, as it's concerned from womb to the tomb. In other words, we need to be about all life in recognizing that all people are important to God. There are no throwaways. There are no people that are less important or less significant than others. Um, you know, one of the ways that we can be pro-life is in the way that we react uh, and interact with our culture is this. You know, it's not enough for us to say we're against abortion. It's not enough for the church to stand strong against abortion, which we should, and we should work to see that, that law overturned. Absolutely. But it's not enough for us to do that because, see, you see, the church can't just say we are against abortion. We also have to describe for our culture how we're for life. That means that we have to work but to help people find alternatives such as, as as adoption services you know adoption in this country is extremely uh, expensive and and I you know my family uh, obviously my brother and his wife uh, adopted a child and it, it was an international adoption but it was extremely expensive and adoption cost a lot the church should be willing to help couples that um, you know that are trying to adopt we should come alongside them with our our resources to help they make that happen we also should support good Christian adoption services there is a great there are great resources even in our area uh, concerning adoption services that are Christ-centered, and we should promote and support those ministries that help people connect by birth mothers to, to families that want to adopt those children. Um, you know, we also need to, to work to care for single moms. You know, uh, obviously, uh, we need to make sure that we are providing resources, money, options, you know, you know, job services, job training, things like that to help young mothers who find themselves as single moms to be able to, to, to survive and make it so that, again, uh, they don't even think about having to abort their baby because they know that there are they're, they're, they're resources available to help them become self-sustaining. We also, men, need to mentor other 
other men. You know, uh, a lot of times men get women pregnant and basically throw their hands up and say, hey, I don't want anything to do with this. And it puts that mo that young mother in a place where she feels like the only decision that she can make is to abort the baby. We need to mentor young men to step up and take responsibility. Uh, you know, these are things that we as the church need to be engaged in because, again, it's not enough for us to say we're anti-abortion. We've got to truly be pro-life. And we've got to work to, uh, to, to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that people that find themselves with an unwanted pregnancy uh, can get connected to the resources that they need to make sure that they can choose life. Uh, we have got a great, great pregnancy care center in our city. The Your Choice Pregnancy Resource Center is, is one of the best in the country. And I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating when I say that. They are one of the best in the country at providing resources and information to, to mothers who, who find themselves with unwanted pregnancies. And, you know, our church wants to underwrite and support the Your Choice Pregnancy Resource Center as best that we can. Uh, they do two major fundraising events throughout the year. You're, you know, back in September, we talked about the Walk for Life. They've been doing that for years, and it's a great way to, for us to help fund uh, the, the yearly uh, annual budget uh, for the center. Uh, but they also, in the spring of the year, well, this is not really spring. It's in February. It's around uh, Valentine's Day. They do the... Uh, the, the pro, their, do their banquet, uh, the Celebrate Life Banquet. Uh, this year, it's going to be on Thursday night, February the 17th at 6 p.m. at Inglewood Baptist Church. Uh, it, it will cost $25 to reserve a seat. Uh, I'd love for our church to buy a table and, and have that table uh, filled with people from Cornerstone Community Church. In fact, multiple tables would be great. Uh, but this is a way that we can help fund resources for uh, mothers so that they do not choose abortion. Uh, they're doing great work at the center. There's great things that, that, that they are, are doing to engage the community. And, uh, you know, there are many ways that we can get involved as a church. You know, we can support them financially. We can actually volunteer. There, there's so many different ways that uh, they use volunteers at the center. Uh, and let's make sure that we're supporting this. You know, again, if we're going to say I'm pro-life, and if we're going to post stuff on our social media about overturning Roe versus Wade, it's not enough for us to just just post stuff and, and talk. We gotta we gotta act. We've got to be willing to put some skin in the game. So I encourage you, Cornerstone. Let's pray about really getting involved with the center. I know the pandemic has been rough for everybody, uh, especially you know centers like Your Choice Resource Center, because again, not being able to be in person at the banquet, not being able to to do a lot with the Walk for Life. Uh, you know, we we definitely want to make sure that they have the resources necessary to continue the great work they're doing. So put that on your calendar, February seventeenth. 6 p.m. Inglewood Baptist Church, $25. We'll be talking more about that in the up in this week and next week uh, as we prepare for that. Um, well, let's let's spend some time in God's Word this morning. Uh, before I do that, I do want to say one quick thing. Uh, happy birthday to my dad. Uh, he is 93 years young today, and i uh, so so blessed to be able to uh, have him in my life and uh, to be able to say that I get to see my dad every day at 93. Uh, but it's, he's lived a long, amazing life and just so blessed uh, to be able to be called his son. So happy birthday to my dad. Uh, this morning, Acts chapter 10, we're going to continue in the same vein that we kind of uh, started last week. Now, obviously, we're going to be getting back to our series that I started uh, you know, two weeks ago on family. Um, We'll get back to that when we get back in person, hopefully this coming Sunday. I don't see any reason why right now we, that there will be another storm blowing through. So we should be able to be back in person next week. We'll get back into our series on family uh, starting then. But last week I, I, we talked in, 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 Acts, uh, in the book of Acts about the interaction between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, it's incredible that story how... That's some coffee. Uh, it, the story is incredible, and in how God—you know—that was a divine encounter. 
And God put Philip exactly where Philip needed to be so that he could share the gospel with this Ethiopian official. And, and as I mentioned at the end of last week, uh, a robust church grew up in Ethiopia, which is in the, in, on the north tip of the, of the African continent. And so literally, the gospel went to a whole other continent because Philip was obedient to, to God saying to him, go, get up, go on that desert road. I've got an appointment for you. You know, what the point of that in the book of Acts is showing how the gospel was spreading outside of Jerusalem. Remember, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up and preached and 3,000 people said, yes, Jesus is Lord, you had the birth of the church. But it was a completely Jewish church. Now, yes, there were people from all over the world, different languages. That ought to be a hint and a half represented and again of Jewish origin they were either pro Jewish proselytes or they were Jewish now even the Ethiopian was probably a proselyte because he had come to Jerusalem to worship um, so he was probably a pro Jewish proselyte as well so what we have here is a, a, a you know a group of Jewish Christians and and again what God is 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 doing is he's moving the gospel out from Jerusalem because again right from the beginning the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis uh, we see that through you, God says to Abraham, through you, in other words, through the Jewish people, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Because you see, God was going to bring the Jewish Messiah through uh, through the Jewish line, and and He was show, we're gonna, He was going to bring about the the salvation of the world through His covenant people, Israel. But it was never meant to just stay within a Jewish context. It was never meant to be one ethnicity or one ethnic group. Uh, the church was supposed to be the people of God and it would encompass all nations of the world. So we see that in Philip. But now today we're going to look in Acts 10 and we're going to see a, a, an interaction uh, between Peter and a, a, a Gentile, Cornelius. He was a centurion in the Roman army. Now, Peter, if you know anything about Peter, Peter was uh, obviously the, one of the chief disciples. He was one of the first uh, disciples that Jesus called to follow him. And Peter emerged as kind of the leader, if you will, of the disciples. He was the ever impetuous one who often spoke before he thought. He was, uh, I'd say, a, probably a man's man. You know, he was a, a rough fisherman. And uh, Peter was was probably pretty robust and probably pretty opinionated and probably spoke a lot. I mean, that reminds you of anybody? Uh, I don't know. Uh, the, yeah, I think Peter really was uh, the, 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 the de facto leader. And, and so for Peter to be the one here that God would use to carry the gospel to a Gentile household was massively huge. Um, we see an encounter uh, later on when Paul is writing in, in the book of Galatians. Uh, he, he describes a, a, a kind of a, a, con, a conflict that he had with Peter. You know, uh, after this, the events of this day, you know, the church began to spread into Gentile areas. And, and Peter shows up uh, at a, a Gentile area to kind of check things out. And he's hanging out with Gentiles. Well, then a group comes from uh, Jerusalem and Peter withdraws. And, P and Paul gets in Peter's face and says, hey, this is not right. You know, while the, while the folks or the Jewish Christians come, you know, aren't here, you're hanging out with Gentile Christians. But as soon as the Jewish Christians get here, you know, you're, you withdraw and you won't hang out with them anymore. And, and Paul confronts him to his face because you see he Paul was convinced Paul his primary calling was to carry the gospel to the Gentiles and so Paul was absolutely convinced that this was God's purpose in moving the gospel from a Gentile a Jewish only orientation to a worldwide orientation and so that's why you know Paul was so quick to get in Peter's face and say that this is absolutely wrong. Now, we're going back here in time to Acts chapter 10, and this is why Peter should have known better. Because you see, Peter was used powerfully by God to take the gospel from a Jewish context into a Gentile context. Uh, let's, let's pick up at verse 1 in chapter 10. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. He was a devout man and feared God along with his whole household. He did many charitable deeds for the Jewish people and always prayed to God. About three in the afternoon, he distinctly saw in a vision an angel of God who came in and said to him, 
Cornelius. Staring at him in awe, he said, What is it, Lord? The angel told him, Your prayers and acts of charity have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also called Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier who was one of those who attended him. After explaining everything to, everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now we'll stop right there. We see here Cornelius is a centurion of the Italian regiment. He was a Roman soldier. A centurion would have been in, in, in charge of a hundred men sent. To, to, that's why the centurion. Uh, so he was, a, uh, he was an officer. And we're told here that, that, that Cornelius had a reputation for being a devout man who feared God with his whole household. And he did many charitable deeds for the Jewish people. Now, I'm not certain that this would indicate that Cornelius was himself a proselyte. In other words, he had, he had become a, a, a Jewish worshiper. It does tell me that he had an affinity for the Jewish people. He had an affinity for the God that he saw uh, in them. Uh, so so we see a man that had that God was drawing, if you will. God was revealing himself to Cornelius. And as he's praying, an angel of the Lord spoke to him. And again, notice exactly what Cornelius says to him. He, he immediately says, what is it, Lord? So we see a heart that is inclined toward God. Very much like the, the Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot. We had a heart that was inclined toward God. A heart that was, was, was desiring to know God. You know, that was an act of God working inside that individual. Awakening that, 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 uh, that, that faith. Awakening that seeking of God. So that's what we've got in Cornelius. But he is a Gentile. And we're going to see why that matters here as we go through the story. Uh, we flip the screen now in verse 9. We've been looking at Cornelius. Now, now the writer of uh, Luke in, in, in Acts uh, goes in verse 9. He, he starts showing us the other side of the story. The next day, as they were traveling and near the city, Peter went up. That's the, the people that were traveling were the, was the contingent that uh, Cornelius had sent. Uh, Peter went up on the roof to pray as they were traveling. Uh, he became hungry and wanted to eat, but while they were preparing something, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and an object that resembled a large sheet coming down, being lowered by its four corners to the earth. In it were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and the birds of the sky. A voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. In verse 14, No, Lord, Peter said, for I have never eaten anything impure and ritually unclean. Again, a second time, the voice said to him, What God has made clean, do not call impure. This happened three times, and suddenly the object was taken up into heaven. Uh, here we have Peter. You know, he's hanging out at Simon the Tanner's house, and he goes up on the rooftop at the noontime hour to pray. Obviously, Peter was an observant Jew. Uh, even though he had said Jesus is Lord, he was still observing the Jewish law. He was still observing the Jewish practices of piety, such as praying three times a day. He went up on the rooftop, and as he was up there, he became hungry, uh, and he fell into a trance. And as he was in this trance, God showed him a vision of this sheet being lowered down, and, and in that sheet or in that basket, if you will, he sees all sorts of animals that are unclean, that the law would say that the Jewish people are never to eat. Uh, probably there was a pig in there, you know, unclean animal. And, and, God, and, he's, and he hears a voice saying, rise up, Peter, kill and eat. Now notice Peter's response. He says, no, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that's impure or unclean. Now, here we're not told uh, that he actually acknowledged or understood that, that the voice he was hearing was God's. But he should have. He, he should have recognized the voice of God. Notice what he says. He says, no, Lord. Now, I want to just point something out here quickly. When the angel of the Lord spoke to Cornelius, what was Cornelius' response uh, in, in verse uh, 4? When he hears the voice of the Lord, he says, what is it, Lord? He submits. But here Peter, the one who should have known the voice of God, and because he's prayed to him three times a day, he's observed the law. When God speaks to him, what does he say? He says in verse 14, No, Lord. Friends, here I think you got a picture of Peter's religion getting in the way 
of his relationship and obedience to God's voice. Religion has a way of doing that. It can get in the way because you see our religious practices begin to become more important to us than being obedient to God. You know, notice that's exactly what's happening here. You know, he's hearing God say, rise up, kill, and eat. And his immediate response is, well, no, God, I can't do that. I, I've, I've never done that because I, I'm a law keeper. I'm keeping the law. See, that's a perfect sign, again, that Peter's still struggling with understanding that his righteousness does not come from keeping the law because the law was given to demonstrate to Peter you can't keep the law. Peter's righteousness comes to him through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that's why how Peter becomes, became righteous through the finished work of Jesus. Not in his ability to keep all these sub-laws and laws and not rising and killing and eating anything that is unclean. So we see here even the hero of the story, one of the heroes, is struggling with the gospel here. Well, this happens three times. God is showing him this thing over and over and over to, to get him to understand what he's getting ready to do. And here it begins to become crystal clear to Peter in verse 17. While Peter was deeply perplexed about what the vision he had seen might mean, right away, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions to Simon's house, stood at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who, had also named, who was also named Peter, was lodging there. While Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him, Three men are here looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them with no doubts at all, because I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men and said, Here I am, the one you're looking for. What is the reason you're here? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who has a good reputation with the whole Jewish nation, was divinely directed by a holy angel to call you to his house and to hear a message from you. Peter then invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and set out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went with him. The following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was expecting them, and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up and said, Stand up, I myself also am a man. While talking with him, he went in and found a large gathering of people. Peter said to them, You know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner, but God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. That's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. Now, I'm going to stop right there, and I'm going to kind of highlight some, some of this text. Uh, Peter is contemplating what this vision means. He's trying to put it all together. He's seen it three times. He's struggling with you know, understanding how the gospel works. You know, he's struggling with letting go of his, you know, propensity to look to his own righteousness that's created through, you know, keeping the laws and whatnot. He, he's struggling with his Jewishness at this moment and, and, his, and his air of superiority, thinking that I am a part of the special covenant people of God and, and I'm not going, going to lower myself to eat this unclean animal. He's struggling with all that. Well, at that very moment, the folks get there that uh, Cornelius had sent. And so he, he goes down and he begins to talk with them. And uh, they tell him why they're there. He, he, they tell him that Cornelius, uh, uh, an upright and God-fearing man with a good reputation with the whole Jewish nation, was divinely directed by a holy angel to call you to his house and to hear a message from you. Peter hears that, he invites them in, they lodge him for the night. The next day he gets up and he goes with them. Obviously at this point Peter has connected the dots. He's realizing, okay God, what you were saying in that vision was preparing me for this encounter. And so he's beginning to connect the dots. Um, he goes into the household as they get there to Caesarea, and immediately Cornelius falls at his feet and begins to worship him. Now that right there indicates something to me that while Cornelius was a God fearing man, he he you know he was very much like the Ethiopian uh, eunuch. Uh, he had a, a, a you know a basic understanding of who God was and a draw toward God, but it, he, he, it was a very, very uh, infantile uh, thought. And so when he sees Peter, he pays homage to him, he worships him, and Peter immediately lifts him up and says, look, I'm a man just like you. I don't deserve to be worshipped and I'm not, I'm not, you know, you, you know, he's pointing right there. He begins to, to show Cornelius that what, what's happening here is not about a man. It's about what God is doing. And so 
here in verse 28, we really see Peter has finally got it all wrapped, his head wrapped around the whole thing. He says, you know, it is forbidden for a Jewish man to associate uh, or uh, with or, with or visit a foreigner. That's speaking from the law. The law would have said that this encounter was making Peter ritually unclean, and therefore he would have to make all sorts of sacrifices and stay away from the temple until he was uh, once again clean to go in. So here he's basically saying that the law, the law of Moses says we, this can't be happening. But notice, but God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. He's going back to the vision. He's beginning to realize that what God was saying and lowering that sheet to him and saying, okay, rise up, kill and eat. God was saying to him, what I have, cl have made clean, you do not call impure. So he's realizing here that God has shown him a principle that God is not at all, uh, you know, saying God is, is not about saying my church is going to be Jewish in ethnicity only. God is saying I am God of the entire world and I want to draw all the nations to myself. Um, so here Peter says that's why I came without any objection and in and, and, and that in the, uh, you know, to what, when I was sent for. And he says, so may I ask ask why you sent for me. Verse 30, Cornelius replied, four days ago at this hour, at three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house. Just then, a man in dazzling clothing stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your acts of charity have been remembered in God's sight. Therefore, send someone to Joppa and invite Simon here, who is also named Peter. He is lodging in Simon the Tanner's house by the sea. So I immediately sent for you, and it was good of you to come. So now we are all in the presence of God to hear everything you have commanded, that, is, that you have been commanded by the Lord. You know, Cornelius tells him, God told me to come get you. And, I, and see, here it indicates, Cornelius didn't really know why. I mean, he just knew that, that Peter had some information or had a message that he needed to hear. And so he sends his, his contingent to get Peter, bring him here, because, again, this is a sign of obedience. He wanted to hear the word of God. He wanted to hear what God was saying. So he, he opens up, and notice here, I, I highlighted this when I was reading it earlier, but in verse 24, Cornelius, Cornelius was expecting them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. Uh, verse 27, when Peter walks in, he went in and found a large gathering of people. See, Cornelius not only was interested in hearing for himself, he gathered his friends and family together in that house because he wanted all of those people, all of his friends, all of his family, to hear this message message from God. What does that tell you about the heart of Cornelius? His was a heart that God was drawing to himself because he knew that Cornelius was a man that, that was, would, would be obedient to what he was saying to him. He knew that Cornelius would be one that would have used the influence that he had been given by God with people, his family and friends. He would leverage that influence to spread the gospel. Here God is, is strategically moving the gospel out of a Jewish context into a Gentile context. And God is doing it through a willing heart. Friends, that's something that's huge for you and I to hear. God will leverage the, the uh, influence He's given you and I with people all around us if we will show ourselves to be people that are obedient. If we will be obedient, God will use us to bring other people around us to the knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ. Verse 30, uh, excuse me, verse 34 Peter began to speak. Now, here's the message that God delivers to Cornelius' household through Peter. Now, I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism. But in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the Israelites, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You know the events that took place throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God appointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil, because God was with him. We ourselves are witnesses of everything he did in both the Judean country and in Jerusalem, and yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. 
God raised up this man on the third day and caused him to be seen, not by all the people, but by us whom God appointed as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge, uh, to be the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. You see here, Peter is preaching the gospel. He starts there and says very much what, the, the, you know, what he had learned from the vision. He said, I understand that God doesn't show favoritism. But in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Right there, you have this Jewish man who is so confident, so, uh, you know, so focused on the law and legalism. You see him finally connecting the dots. The gospel is for all people. God wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ. God wants this gospel not to be the private possession of one ethnicity or one nationality. He wants the gospel of Jesus Christ to go out throughout the world so that all that he, are, he is calling will respond to the, to the gospel as they hear it and begin to follow him and become a part of the people of God. Friends, God is serious about his church being the multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational, multi-racial people of God. He's serious about that. The gospel is never, ever supposed to be the private possession of one people group. It is a message that was supposed and is supposed to be spread throughout the world. And it's supposed to be spread by those of us who have been drawn to Jesus Christ as Savior and have experienced the forgiveness of our sins, who through repentance have, have, have had our lives changed by the grace of God so that we now are new creations living out the gospel message, not only in word, but in deed. You know, he goes on and he preaches the gospel. He tells them the story of Jesus. And he says, now these are things that you've heard about. You, you've heard about the things that happened in Jerusalem and Judea. Caesarea wasn't that far away from, from Jerusalem. So these, they, they knew what had happened. They'd heard the stories about Jesus. And I love verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. And he says, we were witnesses. We were we saw this and we saw what had happened and, and here he gets to it bearing witness how yet they killed him, Jesus, by hanging him on a tree. And he said though in verse 40, Paul, Peter bears witness that God had raised this man up on the third day. He bears witness to the resurrection and caused him to be seen, not by all the people, but by, God, by, by us whom God appointed as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he said, verse 42, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. He preached the gospel. He pointed them to Jesus as the Messiah, the one who would make them righteous. Notice, Peter the Jew doesn't say one word about keeping the law. He doesn't say one word about being circumcised. He doesn't say one word about binding themselves to the food covenants. He doesn't say one word about going up to Jerusalem uh, to worship in the temple. He didn't say any of that. He points them to Jesus. Friends, right there is clear evidence that the gospel is about God's power through Christ. The, the cross of Jesus Christ, the empty tomb, that that is what causes us to be righteous. That's what causes our sins, you know, to, enables us to, to receive the forgiveness of our sins by believing the gospel, by trusting the gospel. You know, Peter is bearing witness here that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's not just the Jewish Messiah. He is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He is God's provision to make us righteous. Again, God is serious about his church being multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multicultural, multi-generational. We are the, the, the people of God and we come from all nations. That is God's vision for the church. Verse 44, 
While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on, the, on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers, the Jewish believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and declaring the greatness of God. Uh, I want to stop here because see, here's God does something really cool right there. Remember the day of Pentecost, uh, Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached to the Jewish audience and the Holy Spirit fell on the, Jew, the, 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 uh, the apostles and the people were hearing them preach with, in other languages that they had not learned and they were hearing the gospel in their native tongue. And that was the, the, the Jewish Pentecost. That was the birth of the church. Here we see the Gentile Pentecost. As Peter's preaching, the Holy Spirit falls on these Gentiles and they begin to have the same experiences that were seen in, 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 in Acts chapter 2. So we can get caught up in trying to make this a doctrinal thing where we say, well, everybody's supposed to speak in tongues. In fact, that word tongues here in the text, it actually means languages. And so the force here is not an unknown tongue. They're speaking in languages that they, they were known languages that they had not learned. And the, the Jewish believers were hearing them speak fluent languages that they had not. So again, it was the same experience here as they had in Jerusalem. This was a unifying event in the early church. You see, those Jewish Christians need to see that God was accepting the Gentile Christians just as he accepted them. They had the same experience. And so they were being bound together as the people of God. You see, right from the big jump, God's saying they're not going to be, there's not going to be a caste system within the church. There's not going to be a group of spiritual haves and a spiritual don't haves. There's not going to be a superiority and a, and a people that aren't quite as good. He is saying that the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians are the same in my eyes because they've come to me through the same sacrifice of my son Jesus. Their sins have been covered by his obedience and the resurrection power that brought him out of the grave. Their, their standing with me is, is, is equal because they have come to me equally through the blood of my son. So right here, he is the, the unity of the church is what's in focus. And don't miss that. Don't devolve, don't devolve this into a, a, a sectarian battle about uh, tongues and interpret. Don't do it. Understand the flow of the text. Understand where this fits in in the narrative that Luke is bringing in this portion of the book of Acts. It's the unity of the church. And we see that played out in the tail end of verse 26 going into verse uh, 40, 47. Then Peter responds it's seeing this can anyone withhold water and prevent these people from being baptized who have received the holy spirit just as we have baptism was a symbol of an, an outside symbol of an inward change peter was saying these Gentile believers are no different than we are. And there we're going to baptize them as a symbol of them being initiated or brought into the family of God just as we were. It's the unity of the church. It's again us seeing here that God is serious about his church being multiracial, multicultural, multinational, uh, you name it, God is showing us. The gospel will know no human distinction or no human boundaries. It all, it's all about people coming to God, humbling themselves, and responding with the faith that God placed in their hearts to place their trust in Jesus Christ. You know, he finishes this out by saying, He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Him to stay for a few days. That shows that they were hungry for more. That, you know, having been, been saved, having to come to understand that Jesus was Lord, they wanted more. They were hungry. And friends, ah, get more coffee. Uh, friends, that should be true of us too. You know, once our hearts have been changed by Christ, it should create in us a hunger, a desire to know more of Him and to, to be more like Him. You know, and, and as we do, as we grow in that hunger, we begin to see our lives being transformed and changed. And I just want to encourage you today. Understand that God is at work in you. You know, I started off this time, you know, describing my friend's post on, on Facebook today about uh, her insecurity and, and, and just how feeling that somehow she was missing something because she, uh, you know, didn't, didn't see this, uh, you know, this, this passion for the Word of God or, or not, not being able to understand it well. Um, friends, 
you know, we grow up into Christ. None of us has arrived. Uh, all of us have uh, some growing to do, myself, chief among you. But understand here that what simply brings us to Christ is a simple acknowledgement that Jesus Christ died for us and that he was raised and now he sits at the right hand of God. You know, none of these Gentile believers had anything to prove. They simply heard the word of God and they responded. You know, Cornelius, God spoke to him. He obeyed. Peter, hearing the voice of God to go, went. Philip, hearing the, the angel of the Lord say to him, go to the desert road, he went. See, you, you see something emerging here? God will always honor the obedience of people that he's drawing. But it does take our obedience. It does take a willingness in us to respond to the voice of God and do what God has called us to do. So I ask you, what's God calling you to do? What have you heard his voice saying to you? You know, how are you responding? Are you are you doing what God called you to do or or are you arguing? You know, Peter argued a little bit. Well, no, I'm not going to eat. He argued. It took three times to get through that head, that hard head what God wanted him to get. You know, are are you more like Peter in this story or are you more like Cornelius? Uh, a heart that was you know, a devout man who who loved God, who prayed and sought God. Uh, are you more like Cornelius? Or are you being more like Peter? You know, uh, be honest about that. And realize that God was working in both of these men to do something incredible. Because you see, there's a bigger story here. You know, God does love people. You get that, right? He, he wants individual people to respond to him. But notice the bigger story behind all this. This was strategic. You know, because Cornelius was a man of influence. And God was going to leverage that influence to spread the gospel. So, you know, a, a secondary thought for you and I. Are we leveraging the God-given influence that He's given that, that we have with people around us? Are we being obedient to the voice of God? You know, a third thought. Do we really get this idea that God is serious about His church being multiracial, multicultural, multigenerational, and and th th do we really get that? Or are we content with our church looking like us? You know, thinking like us, uh, being the same ethnicity as us. Um, do we really have a passion to reach the nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ? People that don't look anything like us, that don't have a story like us, who maybe are different ethnicity, or who don't talk, don't speak the same language. Are we passionate about seeing those people come to Christ? Are we, are we passionate about the people in our community that don't look like us coming to Christ? Or are we willing to cross uh, cultural barriers or ethnic barriers to build intentional relationships with people so that God can leverage those relationships to draw them to Christ? Or are we propping up the, the, you know, the, the subtle racism that are not, and sometimes not so subtle um, that has been prevalent in the, the, the American church for generations? Um, are we willing to, to tilt those windmills? Are we willing to challenge people when they say things that are racist in the church? Uh, are we willing to lovingly rebuke that and say, no, that's not the heart of God? Uh, are we willing to, to go out of our way to make sure that pe all people are comfortable uh, when they come into Cornerstone Community Church? When I say comfortable, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, revolving our church around the likes and dislikes of people uh you know because obviously we got we got we, we you know we want to we want to please god with our church not people yet we want to make sure that we're not pleasing ourselves and creating an environment that is built on our likes and dislikes and we're not loving our neighbors well by simply saying god how do you want to reach the community in which you've planted our church you know, all of these things, I think, come out of this text and, and really bear us to pray through these things, think through these things, and, and just ask the Holy Spirit to direct our path. You know, what's clear in this passage of Scripture, uh, in this whole section, if you will, in Acts, 
God really is about reaching people. And you know what? If we are going to be the people of God, if we are the people of God at Cornerstone Community Church, then we have got to be serious about reaching people with the gospel. And, you know, all of those people are not going to look like us, think like us. We need to let God direct our path. And our simple response to God must be, yes, Lord. Amen, church? Uh, before we spend some time in prayer here, closing things out, I do want to do like we've been doing. I, I, again, I don't think I have the ability on my current screen to see uh, the comments, so I don't know if you guys have been commenting away or not. Uh, but, yeah, okay, I think I just found it. So um, if anybody has any comments or questions or uh, anything that you would like to uh, ask or anything, please go ahead and post it in the uh, discussion thread. And, and you know, unless, uh, you know, I will be glad to, to uh, you know, to answer these directly uh, if I can. Uh, if not, before I close out, at least, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go back to it a little bit later and post a uh, reply to those questions. But, uh, you know, again, as, as difficult it is sometimes to meet on this platform because we're not in the same room, uh, I do want us to build community. I do want us to, to feel connected to one another. And I do see where many of you have uh, indicated you're here. You've uh, told me you were watching. And, and I really do want to thank you for, for taking time out today and uh, and joining us on this uh, discussion feed. And, uh, uh, and, you know, and I hope that God uses this message to challenge you, to encourage you. I do want to challenge you you know obviously the last two weeks not having in-person worship community groups are more important than ever uh it, you know obviously last week not all of our community groups were able to meet because of uh you know weather issues whatnot uh you know we're planning on groups meeting starting tomorrow night uh as long as the roads are cleared up and everything's looking good all of our groups will be meeting as far as i know watch our, our facebook page we'll try to get you make you aware of groups that will not be meeting or i would say call the group leader ahead before you go uh, but please, please make an effort this week to join a community group. Get in fellowship with other Christians and let's spur each other along in being what God wants us to be as the church. You know, God wants to use every one of us to, to spread the gospel. And, and so let's get together. Let's pray for one another. Let's encourage one another. Let's spur one another along. Amen. All right, well, let's have a word of prayer. We'll close things out. Father God, thank you so very much for your word. And God, help us to be obedient to you. Help us to obey your word and do everything you call us to do so that we can be used by you to spread your gospel. I thank you so much for everyone that's been able to join us this morning. And I just pray, God, that you would use this word to accomplish its purpose and that we would be the people of God. I thank you so much, God, for uh, just uh, you know allowing us to, jo to join together like this over Facebook Live. And just pray, God, that you would just continue to use this in our lives and that we would be the people of God pointing people to Jesus Christ. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you guys, and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your uh, Sunday. And again, join a community group this week. Get out, and let's get become the church. God bless you guys. Have a great, great day. Love y'all.